I'm sure Arlen is a big fan right now when you said you wanted to reach out to uh, universities and, and the less privileged because we tend to stay in a bubble when we talk about the entrepreneurship ecosystem on the last event. Uh, 25 minutes, step in traffic on the phone talking about how we need to make it all more inclusive. Um, so we are ahead of the curve in our impact training program, which is for we really go out of our way to try to do it in Arabic, to train in Arabic, to bring in people who wouldn't normally have access. Um, what are your thoughts on how we can actually scale and provide more opportunities to young people who aren't traditionally targeted because we're here speaking English uh, into the ecosystem by providing them with high quality training programs uh, on entrepreneurship and specifically social entrepreneurship in Arabic? Um, and then I'll ask Tiana to comment on that as well because PepsiCo is a big partner up ahead of the curve and also supports the impact program and I think we all need to think about how we can provide more opportunities uh, to to the wider community who aren't traditionally brought into the ecosystem. Um, Dina, we had that discussion before and this is really mainly our strategy for 2016 that we, it's very simple, we just need to go and make them aware, we need to visit, do a, a roadshow, we need to visit universities, we need to go to them, we can't wait for them to come to us. We need to go and reach out to them. So we need to do a roadshow uh, to all the universities in Egypt, if we can cover it, to, to reach out to the region, because we do cover the region. And this is covering the region, not just uh, Egypt. We need to go to them. We need to do like a, maybe a two-day workshop where they come in and uh, they, they get a feel of what it is, uh, for example, a program like IMPACT, which you have seen the impact of IMPACT. In fact, if, if you know, for lack of better words, that people do get um, overwhelmed and amazed by by the by the uh, the impact that they can do and the fact that they have knowledge that they didn't know about they have talent that they didn't know about and then they can actually go out there and do a pitch for a project that would in a year or two be successful and the results we've seen so I believe that working together and I'm sure that we can work with Amr and we can we can take it forward is that we need to reach out to more uh, countries I mean this year we focused on five countries next year we should reach out more we should go to universities and conduct but we need the private sector to invest in this we need more private sector investments we need uh, like Abdullah said yesterday leap of faith where they come in and put you know, uh, an amount and say, I would like to invest in 20 universities, let's do a roadshow of impact around the region and let's reach out to the less privileged students where we can actually make a difference. And, and this is our focus for 2016. Thank you, Maria. We're going to hope you do that to bring in another 10 companies to support and invest. So, so Tepec, we'll go to you. Um, <laughs> because uh, Pe PepsiCo across the region has been a huge advocate of uh, social entrepreneurship and um, as a company you have a heavy focus on purpose and you, you're doing a lot of work to think about business with purpose. So my, my question to you is very much related to what Maria was saying is how do we get more companies to invest in entrepreneurs who are really trying to um, create financial value but solve a major problem in society and how does a company as large as PepsiCo work on doing that um, not necessarily through uh, just by supporting programs like Impact, but you have a massive supply chain. So what do companies like PepsiCo do to actually integrate some of these rising entrepreneurs uh, within the PepsiCo supply chain and people who are really trying to innovate in spaces like water and the environment, which are critical issues to a company like, like PepsiCo? Very well. Thank you very much for the chance. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, I think one of the things that we really believe in that uh, social entrepreneurs are the key driver for uh, society development. Uh, that's why we have basically uh, realized that over time, uh, coming to such an event uh, every year uh, makes you realize the fact that uh, those young boys and girls are the accelerator of the economy in the future. So, uh, and we realize another fact as well that. Uh, there is a very high ratio of failure uh, behind two simple reasons. Uh, their need for uh, uh, seeds of finance, uh, very little money that they can start up with uh, a good idea. And the second thing is how to build their capabilities and how to build their knowledge in order to face uh, the problems that they might face uh, in the future. So, uh, 
that goes very well with our performance with purpose. It goes very well with our vision and uh, the corporate vision that we're putting together in order to support the entrepreneurs in the future. So throughout the time, we've supported more than 300 projects. Uh, in 2015, standalone, we've done six with different great partners in Egypt. Uh, I think uh, this year we're going to put together three, three projects, uh, uh, three winners that we're going to provide them with capability building, seed funding, and then acceleration and, uh, and give them the, the right support and, and, uh, in across all the, the functions as well. However, the one thing that we've learned out of our discussion with those young boys and girls is it's, it's not about a project to win. It's about even if they try hard, we can really bring them in and give them the right experience and the right support in order for them to, to grow their ideas and, and become better than that. Uh, I think the, the role they will play in, in making the economy better will return with a good thing across all the companies, especially on the private sector part. The private sector part uh, depends on consumers. So those guys can be more, can represent more, better economy to consumers and also they can become the supplier of the future. So many of those ideas ties very well with our needs as a company as well. For example, I was giving that example yesterday in, in our pitch that that liter of light uh, uh, idea, for example, it came of one of the small entrepreneurs which turned to be a great idea that can really serve the society and can deliver with our performance with purpose, but also really benefit the society. So we want to pay back a bit of what we really make in Egypt and return it back to the society and make it better. So many other ideas like this. I was giving another example as, as well, that one of our crews in one of the, our biggest, biggest plants in Cairo, they came up with a very innovative ideas to reserve 40% of the water in that facility. So we're producing with less, with 40% less water in, in, in a huge facility that has a lot of production lines. So again, they have came up with a very simple ideas. Uh, I think a lot of the private sector companies has to really give them the chance to innovate, to give them the right level of support and give them the right level of transferring knowledge as well. Because it's not good. It's not only about the money. Uh, maybe the money will, will let them survive for a, for a simple period, but the knowledge, the experience, is the thing that it will make a turnaround to their experience and to their, uh, to, to their ideas as well. Yeah, I think uh, yesterday we had a round table and we were talking about the private sector, not good people in the audience that, you know, sometimes the private sector doesn't really know what to do. And uh, because private it's very difficult for a private company to invest in a startup in order to actually invest equity financing in a startup. Or that's what he was saying. But we often say that the private sector can become very creative in integrating people, uh, new businesses within their supply chain to help them grow. And I think that's a discussion we're not yet having, is how can large companies innovate? Because big businesses really struggle to innovate after a certain time. And it's very important to make that connection between the very established big businesses, multinational businesses, and the ones that are coming up in the pipeline to really think how to integrate those innovations within your supply chain. So I think also the, the private sector really needs to think about, in a more creative way, how do they make sure that when they're thinking about their supply chain, that they're choosing new businesses um, who really need that kind of support to help them, them grow as well. Uh, I think two, uh, two, two points, it's, uh, it's a great two points actually. Uh, yeah. uh, the innovation, when you have a, a, a big company and it's really doing well and it's uh, sizable enough to, to, uh, to really get over the, the economy issues, uh, if you wish to say, we fear innovation. However, when you go to those young boys and girls, they don't really feel much of innovative ideas, of trying their ideas. So, the private sector has to be very acceptance, to, to provide acceptance to the ideas and really take them in and try them uh, uh, and give that kind of support to the, to the, the, the entrepreneurs. The second point that private sector can also help the entrepreneurship society to negotiate with the governments on a more simpler uh, 
uh, laws that can really support the startups because the laws that we have currently maybe will suit bigger entities but not really will help such a such a startup. So, yes, so Sunny uh, Vitwani really did, did try, suffer a bit in the traffic this morning. Two hours. Two hours. I think I don't have the same thing. So, uh, Sunny Vitwani works for Mostasset Mosfet Khair, and uh, my background, uh, pre-mind, ahead of the Kurdish, has been always in philanthropy and civic engagement. So, I'm very critical of the philanthropic sector, although I think Sunny is a big advocate for using philanthropic money in a more creative way. So, my own personal opinion, this is a personal opinion, is that the philanthropic sector in the Middle East is not doing what it should do to support entrepreneurship and job creation. Um, they're not thinking more creatively in terms of how do they invest in startups. They're not thinking of job creation as a social justice issue. And uh, I think it's very critical for the philanthropic sector to also, like the private sector, have a paradigm shift and think very carefully about how to support social entrepreneurs, so, so companies that are financially viable, but are also really creating uh, large-scale social impact at the same time. But you started a program called Just Under um, Assessment Master Kid that is really thinking about this in a critical way. Can you talk to us very briefly about the role of the philanthropic sector in supporting social entrepreneurs um, in just a few minutes? What role do you think the sector should play and uh, I think everybody can go up and look up just after that. Okay. Um, uh, at the beginning, the program itself, as you mentioned, Dina, that uh, Muscle Hill as a foundation, its mainstream activity is charity activity. So uh, it's mainly to take donation, and then this donation is uh, given to people who are in need, and this need could be an urgent need, like uh, having um, um, uh, they need food, uh, they need clothes, and this is the most of the budget of the, the foundation goes to this urgent uh, type of activities. Um, three years ago, they started uh, to have uh, a new wave of uh, programs that make um, uh, this kind of donation has larger uh, effect or impact by having uh, small income generating projects. So uh, they give uh, a kiosk, a sewing machine, uh, a cow, something for the family so that the family is able to take um, this kind of uh, small investment and uh, it can maintain uh, their uh, own uh, uh, economic uh, uh, needs, uh, they can raise their kids and so on. But still, uh, this is um, uh, the impact of uh, this kind of activities is dependent on the amount of donation you receive. You give it to a number of families, but it's, it cannot be taken to scale. In, uh, in 2014, we started this guest program. And uh, the idea uh, that the foundation started uh, with this uh, program is uh, uh, take, uh, using uh, entrepreneurs as a vehicle to think of innovative, affordable, products and services that will help those people who live under the poverty line to have better life, to empower them. But again, because the mainstream is from, is a charity activity, we have taken very small amount of fund to start this program. But what really supported us to move forward in this is the private sector. And, and I'm very happy because I'm sitting here beside you, because PepsiCo is yeah, our main uh, uh, supporter in, in this. Whenever we have an idea and they are taking it, how, how can we support entrepreneur, entrepreneurs who are making a social impact, who are thinking of people who live under the poverty line to find for them different ways of uh, uh, accessing um, uh, um, education, uh, water, clean water, energy that's not easy for them to have. Um, so I'm going to actually switch to uh, the gentleman sitting to my left, um, who's an actual social entrepreneur, and someone I admire greatly, not just because he's a friend, but because he's created a business that can really make a difference. So I'm just the founder and CEO of a um, of healthcare business, um, called Smart Medical Services, and uh, what he's doing is he's really trying to create a, a new system and a new way of thinking about healthcare in Egypt, and a way to include everybody within a very dysfunctional healthcare system. So I'm, uh, I was hoping that you could talk a little bit about how you can actually 
to create a business that does make money, but that can really make a difference at the systemic level. And uh, also, maybe you can comment on this whole idea of it's, it's not necessarily wrong to make a lot of money and make a big difference at the same time, because we often think we have to do one or the other, or let us make money first and then think about social impact later. But you've really integrated a model that is doing both, and I think it's very important for people to hear about that. Thank you, Ina, for having us. The idea is that in the healthcare system in all the world, and especially in Egypt, is extremely dysfunctional. So the concept, the keywords are inclusion and access. Now, everyone in Egypt is socially stratified in every single aspect. In anything you do, and any of these amazing projects which are done, if you're not healthy, then you won't be able to do them. And if you're uneducated, you won't be able to do them. So the idea is including the excluded. There are 50% of the Egyptian population is not even covered by social health insurance. So in other words, they have no access whatsoever to anything. That includes people, children, newborns, essential basic needs. And again, Egypt is a quite sick country. We have 12 million diabetics, 25% of the population has hypertension. And not everyone really knows that. And these people are not being treated. And this is the human capital. These are the real resources this country has, is its population. This is the main thing which we have to work on. So what we try to think about is how to establish a system where the regular healthcare facilities we can include into it other underprivileged. There are two problems in healthcare. One of them is the emotional safety, safety net, and one of them is the cost. We have to admit that the resources are very limited. So if, if you're sick and you're underprivileged, you have no one to call, you have nowhere to go to, there's no one you can approach you get lost, and it probably ends up that you will spend up more money than someone from who is more privileged. So it ends up that the poor spend more in getting treated because they don't know who, where to go, they don't know who to ask. So we do we include them into the system, we allow them to have a call center access where we direct them to different services. The same service can cost between a thousand pounds and six hundred pounds in the same geographic area, but they do not know that. And if they need a second opinion in a surgery, they have no one to go to. Again, if you're privileged, then you have your friends, you have your families, because you come from a social side, your social level, which allows you to do that. So the concept is including them into the system, solving a big part of their safety net. Now they feel they have someone to call, they have advice. They're part of the system, instead of actually being completely excluded. And this is not expensive, and it is profitable. The other part is, we manage for insurance companies and we manage for companies, their healthcare programs. So we get better rates because of our volume. We pass along these better rates to them. It costs us nothing. And again, we're still making money. And this is the point Dino is making. There are a lot of models in essential industries. Essential industries as in these are education, health. We cannot do anything if we're not healthy and if we can't educate ourselves. And the concept of exclusion in everything. Um, everyone speaks English, everyone, we, we talk about the private sector and we forget that more than 90% of the population is not really included into that ecosystem. So <clears throat> you can find in an essential industry a model where you will be making money from the beginning and benefiting underprivileged society. And the, someone was saying yesterday, in the private sector, if you want to continue to make money and sustain that profitability, you have to have a society which can afford to do that. So it's actually in your best interest from the beginning to have that society healthy and uh, educated, and they benefit. Thank you, Robert. I, I urge you all to um, go to Robert after this and ask him what actually motivated him to start this business. Uh, I think we only have about four minutes left, but I'm going to actually be pushing and ask for another three. So um, we're going to end with Mona. And uh, Mona, uh, Rise Egypt and you in particular, you've been spending a lot of time working on social entrepreneurship, but when we think about social entrepreneurship, you and I, we think about entrepreneurship that is really thinking about change at the system's level. So the discussion around scale is usually around scaling individual companies, but if we really want to scale impact, at the systems level, what should we be thinking about? A few years ago, <clears throat> I co-founded an organization called Rise Egypt, 
which is a coincidence of names with the Rise Up Summit. So it was nice because we thought we can just leverage each other with the platform and the, and the work on the ground. Um, but I think this is a really important point, that in social entrepreneurship, we tend to think about what can we do to help scale companies um, or not sustainable nonprofits um, in particular, and we think in isolation about the scale up and capacity building of those entities. Um, but at Rise Egypt, we really consider ourselves an organization that supports entrepreneurship for development in Egypt. So we consider ourselves taking a more holistic and systemic approach, um, down. Um, more systemic approach to development. One of our um, flagship programs is um, a two-year fellowship program for social enterprises in Egypt. And we have five companies and um, sustainable nonprofits in this program. And what we're doing is not just capacity building with them, um, but we're really taking an evidence-based approach to think about if scaled, how can it make an impact at the national level or, across, or within their sectors. Um, and in order to do that, we then have to connect with academia and research. We have to connect with policymakers. We have to connect with corporates and CSRs. And we have to think critically about philanthropy and investment. Um, and so I'll give some concrete examples because I think it really crystallizes it more. Um, we, have one, um, we have one organization, for example, in our first fellowship program that's working on education. Um, and what we're doing with them, they've launched an innovative community school model, Educate Me. And what we're doing with them is actually linking up with some of the best researchers in the world in this area of impact evaluation to think about what, um, what is the actual impact, what are the outcomes um, that we're seeing through this new model versus the alternative in Egypt? And how can we look at, how can we design a pilot study um, so that they have some data for decision making, essentially, within their organization and can scale up in a more um, uh, factual way? Uh, and often, I think, in the social sector and in the development sector, we, we have feel-good stories and we have anecdotal stories about um, what, uh, you know, what looks nice and who's happy and you know charity but we're really trying to move away from the charity model completely to investment because it's very clear um, that there are not enough dollars uh, in, 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 um, in, in development right now to address the issues and we have to engage the private sector and we have to engage um, sort of patient capital from philanthropy to attract risk capital from traditional private equity investors. Um, and so what we're doing with them is then using this evidence to go to investors um, and the government and think about how can we partner, how can we catalyze public-private partnerships um, in order to enable the scale. And we can see this from two different angles. On the one hand, the more kids that are educated, the more you get the outcomes that, um, that you're talking about. But you're also creating jobs for these administrators, for these educators, for the community that's involved with them. Um, and so it's really a multi-pronged approach and so one of the things that we have to think about is um, enabling more organizations, I mean this is our plug, like RISE and like others all over the ecosystem that we can see, um, to work not just in a single fashion, um, but to be, we need sort of these glues that are pulling from different parts of society, um, whether it's the private sector, government, or philanthropy, and that are grounded in the actual solutions on the ground. And we need to be partnering with, we don't consider ourselves delivering services to social enterprises. We consider ourselves partnering with these social enterprises to create impact in Egypt. Um, and I think that that's a really important angle to take into consideration. Thank you, Mona. Um, I think we have to end. Uh, does anybody have one burning question? Or are you okay with ending? Okay. All right, well, I just wanted to thank the panelists for all of your valuable comments. Um, I know there's another panel coming in behind us, so thank you all for being here, and, and thank you to the audience for coming and fighting through the traffic, and thank you, Hideyat, for putting this together. Thank you, Dina. Thank <laughs> you.